Morning, Emily. Good morning, Eileen. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. It's spitting a little snow here. Yeah, it's actually really coming down here right now. Oh, wow. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, I knew it was supposed to snow, but I did not believe that it was actually going to happen. Yeah, just a little, a little setback. <laughs> Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Looks like a winter wonderland today. Does, Does everybody have mm, poor man's fertilizer, right? We hope so. Let's hope it leaves just as soon as it can. Eileen, do you have snow over there, Washington County? It is kind of spitting snow going back and forth between snow and rain. I think they call that slain. Slain. <laughs> it's very common here. <laughs> it's hard to commit on the coast. <laughs> Just so many options. That's right. <laughs> Hi, Heidi. Morning. Let's see. People are starting to kind of filter in. We'll give it five more minutes here for folks to join us. We've got a few more that we're waiting for. We have somebody from the West Coast joining us.
Anyone have some big weekend plans? Winter avoidance. <laughs> I might try paddle boarding again if the wind calms down, not fall in the water. <laughs> yeah, that might be a little chilly. We might try a hike if it's if it's reasonable out. We'll see. Gold Coast. <laughs> I'm looking for uh, extremely, <laughs> <laughs> extremely easy hikes at this point. Jolene's at the point where like she's heavy enough that like I can carry her in the backpack, but it's like, cool. All right. <laughs> you need to walk some of this. <laughs> Morning, Casey. back again um my zoom keeps freezing and then kicking me off here so hopefully hopefully it doesn't keep doing this morning cynthia good morning i was having trouble too but i think i'm okay now it's that winter weather must be <laughs> you guys over here too. No. Okay. Keep minutes. We're well, still waiting for a few folks. Um, I think I'm just gonna get going though, if everyone is okay, and then uh, people can join us as they come along. All right. So if everyone um, could mute, if you're not presenting, that would probably be the best for some Zoom room. Uh, rules. And if you have any questions, feel free to um, chat, use the chat option in the bottom. And I'm going to keep tabs on who has questions throughout the presentation and we'll have a chance in between each person to discuss and answer questions. And then we'll have time at the end of the presentation if there are additional questions that come up. So I just want to say thank you and good morning for coming. My name is Sarah Robinson and I'm the executive director for the Piscataquis County Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, I appreciate everyone coming this morning to our webinar that we're hosting today, Getting Your Feet Wet, Enhancing Fish and Wildlife on Your Property. And welcome to all the presenters and guests. We appreciate you joining us. So the information and um, projects discussed today are made possible through the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, also known as RCPP of the Natural Resources Conservation Services, NRCS, 
in partnership with the conservation, uh, excuse me, in partnership with the Nature Conservancy, TNC, which is available through 2022. And last summer, the Piscataquis County Soil and Water Conservation District joined the RCP partnership through a subaward from TNC. And the Soil and Water District has hired a full-time stream restoration project manager, Emily Dickinson, who will be leading the presentation today. So I'd like to hand this over to Emily. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. As a quick overview, we will be um, talking about the importance of free-flowing streams, wildlife habitat fragmentation, the design of stream smart crossings, road management and road and stream barrier evaluations, funding and technical assistance. Thank you for the introduction, Sarah. I'd like to mention again that I'm the Stream Restoration Project Manager with the Piscataquis County Soil and Water Conservation District. And today I'll be talking to you guys specifically about the importance of free flowing streams for marine economy, aquatic and terrestrial species, and for management purposes. As many of you here today probably partake in one of Maine's most popular outdoor sports, fishing, I'm pretty proud to say that Maine has what we would call gold star fisheries. 97% um, of wild brook trout waters in the eastern United States are located right here in Maine, where you can go and catch yourself some beautiful native brook trout. Interestingly, uh, landlocked salmon originate from four main lake systems, as well as Lake Champlain and um, Lake Ontario. And from these lake systems, um, Atlantic salmon, I meant uh, landlocked salmon have been relocated uh, all over the world. I would also like to include not only are our cold water fisheries um, really popular, we also have some great warm water fisheries that people, many people take advantage of. So it's pretty amazing that you can strike off into the woods here in Piscataquis County and catch yourself some world-class fish. Maine's recreational fisheries employs around 3,330 people. There are around 260 thousand anglers who purchase Maine fishing licenses annually. And of those anglers, they spend around $210 million a year. So if you think about your local, the local revenues that go to lodges, guiding services, bait and tackle shops, uh, restaurants and other stores, it really stimulates Maine's economy. You can also think about the taxes that are put on um, uh, fishing products that are bought by these anglers and these taxes help fund our fisheries management departments here in Maine. There's also been a big boom in outdoor recreation due to COVID-19. More people are just looking to get outside and enjoy our natural resources and um, more people are looking, personally I've seen more people looking to get out of the city and going to rural areas or relocating back here to Maine. So you could expect that in this last year, um, more people are, are getting out and fishing, and hopefully this is a trend that continues. What's also unique about Maine's fisheries is that we have the only population of Atlantic salmon left in the United States. Uh, Atlantic salmon were federally listed, in, uh, federally listed in 2000, and this was due to over over utilization of salmon by both recreational and commercial fisheries, which contributed to the decline of their population. There's also been historic habitat loss, um, habitat fragmentation, and just degradation of watersheds um, in general. Uh, along with uh, rising water temperatures in many areas where warming waters um, have led to invasive fish, and um, these fish have been able to outcompete Atlantic salmon. Uh, here on the right hand side of the page, you can um, see the Gulf of Maine distinct population segment of Atlantic salmon in pink, and that's where they currently occur, along with the dashed area, which, um, which illustrates the designated critical habitat that is prime habitat areas that are key for protection and restoration efforts.
Here is a great illustration of why habitat connectivity, specifically for Atlantic salmon, is so important. Um, each one of these labeled areas within a watershed are specific habitats that they use throughout their life cycle. Uh, the beginning of their life cycle, Atlantic, adult Atlantic salmon travel to fresh water to, lay, um, to dig their reds and lay their eggs in specific substrate um, within their spawning habitats. From there, they move to their rear, rearing habitats where they um, utilize seasonal areas, foraging areas, and um, take refuge during the warming of the summer. So when water warms, they go to these deep, these deep water pools along with cold water areas for refuge. So all of these habitats, they travel throughout their, um, throughout their the streams and watershed systems play a critical role for the population. So if they cannot move freely from their spawning habitat to their nursery habitat, um, they will not be able to grow to their smolt stage and migrate to the ocean to become adults. Uh, so these local habitats are key along with, um, the local habitats are key for being connected along with the travels to the ocean. Okay, so I've been talking about fish a lot. So it's not all about it's not all about fish. Um, many and many other animals, such as turtles, amphibians, and mammals, uh, need free flowing streams, um, or they may take dangerous treks over roadways. So here's a picture of a wood turtle that I actually found locally uh, crossing the road, where it decided to travel over very steep banks and over um, dangerous roadways instead of using the crossing um, underneath the road. So, so it's not just about the fish. Many of us see um, other amphibians in the road along as mammals who haven't been able to make these treks. So it's really important that structures not only include um, the free flowing stream, but portions of the banks as well. So these banks we all often refer to as wildlife shelves where they provide dry passage underneath crossings that animals such as minks and turtles can cross instead of heading into the roads. Now, what are barriers? They are obstructions that prevent the passage of aquatic organisms and impede natural functions such as stream material and nutrient movement. Um, oftentimes structures like culverts pinch the stream um, where water is flushed through these, these culverts as in like a water cannon and create velocity issues where fish are not going to be able to enter the crossings because the stream is flowing um, too fast through the structures. Oftentimes there are pools at outlets that are too shallow and they cannot access the crossings. Um, and then there, the flows within the crossings themselves differ from uh, the streams. So they can be they can be almost dry or um, just not adequate amount of water for fish to pass. What I see a lot here in Piscataquis County is that the crossings are stalled incorrectly and they're completely perched. Um, and this disconnects the structure from the flow of water altogether. And oftentimes it's a combination of all of these scenarios. So Maine's, Maine's rich logging history has created many barriers on this landscape, on our landscape, as well as just generalized, um, generalized expansion of civilization. So it's not only the historic, it's not only the historic um, barriers on our landscape, but currently a lot of structures are being placed that are not adequate for aquatic organism passage. Here are examples of culverts that are inadequate for passage here in Piscataquis County. On the left-hand side, there's an example of a perched culvert where the flow um, is completely disconnected from the stream and, and organisms are not able to get up into that structure as, long, as well as a dry, um, in the middle, a dry structure where there's no flow through the culvert. Oftentimes, uh, culverts, inlets hold back um, 
natural nutrients that would flow through the stream. So leaves, twigs, and gravel as well. Now on the left hand picture, this is called a scour pool. And this is where the velocities of streams flush natural um, stream material into one area or um, move road material that has, has um, eroded into the stream. And this creates a physical, a physical barrier, as you can see in the picture. And um, a lot of times roads are impoundments themselves. They hold back water because they're not allowed, the water does not reach the crossing. And this creates dead water areas where often kills trees. And uh, during the summertime, these waters will warm and become, uh, become too warm and deter uh, certain cold water species. Oftentimes with undersized structures, um, road stream crossing failures occur. So this obviously looks like an environmental issue. The structure has been um, flushed down the stream along with yards and yards of the roadway. Um, that's obviously uh, not good for the stream. It's not something that naturally occurs within the stream. And this is also an issue that denies access for humans um, and becomes a safety concern. Oftentimes people will uh, go and retrieve structures that have washed out like this culvert here on the right hand side of the photo. They place them back um, in, the, in the roadway and build on top of it. So as you can see, this is a recurring issue during extreme, extreme weather events. So management wise, you're using time and money and resources for an issue that um, can occur during uh, major storm events. Here's another picture that is actually of the same stream um, and the same area during a major event that happened in Somerset County back in 2016, where seven inches of rain fell within five minutes and took many um, road stream crossings with it. This is a huge issue because it denied access to over 100 landowners and many were actually trapped on the other side. So with stream events, a lot of our current infrastructure um, cannot withstand them. And due to climate change, um, we're gonna have these extreme weather events happening more and more. Um, and then overall precipitation due to climate change is currently occurring. So um, a lot of structures cannot withstand this. Another environmental threat um, for climate change and for aquatic organisms is increasing water temperatures where fish in our um, fish such as brook trout can occur um, in water temperatures between 68 to 75 on the high range. And with, with increasing water temperatures, this is a major threat um, to our aquatic species. This doesn't really pertain to us much, but sea level rise is something that um, it's currently occurring and um, a lot of municipalities here in the state of Maine and um, state DOT are currently addressing sea level rise and prepared for a lot of the road infrastructure to be underwater. They're replacing um, certain structures that can inhibit um, wetland migration. And like I said, it's not so common here, but um, on the co Maine's coast, it is a huge threat. So what can we do to help prevent um, scenarios like this here in the picture? Uh, we can adopt better management plans for road stream crossings by implementing stream smart rules of structure design. So this is where I'm gonna turn it over to Heidi um, who will, will discuss stream smart structures, but I can take some questions right now before we make this transition over. Looks like Barbara had a question. Are there innovations in culverts to help? Let's see. So innovations in culverts. Um, so typically we want to design um, structures to match the natural um, stream uh, material. So oftentimes uh, arch culverts that are bottomless are um, a great alternative to round culverts. 
And this is actually a great question for the next um, presenter, but basically we want to be able to span the stream along with part of the banks to allow high flows to go through these culverts. So being able to use watershed hydrology information to size structures, right? Um, there are small brooks that can have culverts and those can be adequate size, adequately sized for um, certain flows. So it's all about figuring out the hydrology and what will work um, cost wise for structures. I don't know if there's a follow up to that, if they're looking for a specific, um, maybe type of culvert. Well, thank you for asking the question. We are gonna take more questions at the end. So if we do not cover anything, the net, um, cover over the importance of sizing structures, right? We can, uh, we can answer those questions at the end. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm going to turn it over to Heidi. Let me figure out where all my stuff went. <laughs> well, thank you, Emily. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Heidi Bunn, and I am the aquatic restoration engineer for the Natural Resources Conservation Service in Maine. Um, I'm happy to be presenting alongside Emily, Steve, and Eileen today to give you all an overview as to what kind of teamwork is really needed to get stream smart crossings on the ground and how we use the Stream Smart process to plan and design and construct crossings in Maine. Next slide, please. So when the Maine Audubon and the NRCS joined together 10 years ago to create Stream Smart Crossing workshops, I don't think anyone imagined how much it would grow. But thanks to all the hard work that all the Stream Smart partners have put in over the years, a really strong aquatic restoration network was created this has helped to expand the number of projects that the main NRCS has been involved in. The engineering portion of the Stream Smart Crossing workshops are hands-on and hopefully post-COVID, we can actually start having some of these um, in Dover so we can get you guys out in the field with us. But it gives participants an opportunity to learn how to do some of this simple surveying and data collection for stream crossings. We go and we visit real sites, we take measurements, we measure pebbles and rocks, um, and then we go back to the classroom to analyze the data. And the goal is that everyone will walk away remembering the golden rule. Let the stream act like a stream. We want to install a structure that the stream does not know is there. This is really a shift in focus from trying to squeeze a stream through a culvert to designing a road to go over a stream. Next slide, please. I don't know if the next, oh, there it is. So the Stream Smart design options that are discussed in training and order of preference, which Emily kind of touched on when she was answering the question is, we really want to avoid creating a crossing in the first place. So is there an alternative access point that can be used? If the road is no longer used, can we remove the old crossing and restore the channel to its natural conditions? We call this decommissioning a site. Um, or even if, you know, if there's a harvest, that's not gonna happen for 10 or 20 years. You know, why not take out, you know, the old infrastructure um, and just let the channel do its thing until you really need to get back in there. And we can install an open bottom structure that meets at least the 1.2 times bank full, can pass the design storm and allows for this passage of target species at multiple flows. This is really the most common option that is utilized by the NRCS when we're replacing an existing crossing. And the final option is to install an embedded culvert using a full stream simulation method to rebuild the channel through the culvert. This is not commonly used in Maine as the size of the culverts required is usually prohibitive. And we would really prefer to allow the stream to be able to adjust on its own. Next slide, please. So Stream Smart, we have some rules of thumb, but Stream Smart is really just a simplified version of the US Forest Service's stream simulation method. We 
We use the five S's to highlight the planning and design process for contractors, landowners, and designers so that everyone is really speaking the same language. When I'm talking to someone about installing a stream smart crossing, they have a basic understanding of what that means, and I'm not starting from ground zero every time. This slide shows the five S's of stream smart. You want to span the stream, set the elevation right, slope and skew match the stream, and we want to make sure that there's substrate in the crossing. If all five S's are incorporated into the design, we will have met the golden rule. Next slide, please. So when we say span the stream, what we mean is installing a structure that lets the stream act like a stream. In order to do this, we need to figure out what the channel dimension should be at the site if we lived in a perfect world without any barriers. We want to get measurements outside of the influence of the existing crossing so that we can avoid creating a pinch point in the stream. The pictures above show the before and after of a site that was very flat with a wide floodplain upstream and a six foot deep plunge pool downstream with a series of beaver dams. The before photo shows the twin seven foot diameter culverts that had been historically used to block off water upstream for irrigation. The after photo shows the 60 foot span bridge that was installed with a 25 foot wide low flow channel and small floodplains on each side for dry passage for other critters. This project was done in conjunction with another crossing approximately one mile upstream. The site is located in critical habitat for Atlantic salmon and brook trout, who now have access to and from the ocean. Fixing these two crossings opened up approximately 15 miles of upstream habitat that is essential for not only stream health, but for the life cycles of many aquatic species, as Emily mentioned. As a side note, this site is a perfect example of how StreamSmart has helped to create contractor buy-in on the importance of the aquatic work we are doing. Regardless of background, Byron is getting people to feel invested in the success of the project. This site had the highest number of aquatic creatures that I've ever seen during construction, which Emily and Eileen can attest to. We had turtles, we had American eels, we had brook trout, we had sea lamprey, we had mussels, we had warm water fish species, we had crayfish. Like I've never seen so much stuff that needed to get moved. Um, but we had to relocate all of those outside of the construction area, which was often um, pretty muddy to walk through. But we arrived on site one day and I saw a pink and purple net sitting on the side of the stream and the contractor admitted to me that he had taken his daughter's butterfly net so that he could help us rescue critters. Throughout construction, I watched him stop the excavator and jump into the mud to go rescue an eel or a fish. The best part was that at the end of the day, when the landowner would come down to see how much progress had been made, it was the contractor who was talking to him about what we had found and why they were important to the stream. When I can step back and let someone else explain the importance of our work, I know that I've done my job. Next slide, please. So after we figure out how big the structure needs to be, the next step is making sure we set the elevations right. One of the things we stress in the workshops is the need for a long stream profile so we can figure out how deep to set the abutments and what the channel bottom elevation should be. Streams are a dynamic system and they're constantly adjusting vertically and horizontally. So by sparing the stream, we are giving it room horizontally to move. By setting the elevations right, we are giving it room to adjust vertically and allow for natural stream processes to occur. By understanding that, we are really setting up the crossing for success. When I first started working on bridges in Maine, I was constantly listening to contractors complain about how far down they needed to dig and how they've been installing bridges since before I was born and they had never installed abutments this deep. Or this culvert has been in here for 50 years and it worked just fine, regardless of the fact of how many times it had blown out and there was gravel downstream that we could see and they had to replace that every year. But you know, why did I need to design a bridge that was so big? I really hear a lot less of that now. As stream events get bigger and more frequent, they are seeing that the stream smart structures have been able to pass the storms without a problem while the old crossings keep washing out. People are catching on and having that common lingo to talk about why the old crossing isn't working is really helpful in finding a solution. Next slide, please.
So slope and skew are two things that I feel people don't normally think about when they're looking at a crossing, but they're two things that can really drastically change the type and size of the structure being planned and installed. When we talk about the slope of the channel, this is where a long stream profile really comes in handy and helps us to make sure that we are setting the elevation um, correctly at the crossing. Are we in a steep section with a series of step pools and boulders that are not gonna move? Or are we in a flatter section with pools and riffles with gravels and cobbles that are more likely to move in big storm events? Or is our crossing in a transition area where we're going from a steep section to a flatter section where we would expect smaller material to settle out? Knowing what the channel slope should be through the crossing gives us an idea as to how much the channel is gonna adjust up and down over various flows so we know that the structure that we design can handle those fluctuations. So we know we need to span the stream and we know what elevations we want the channel to be at the crossing. Now we need to look at the layout because streams are not always straight and may flow toward the crossing at an angle to the road. This might be because of the natural meander in that, in that system, or it might be because of the undersized structure that was there had caused the channel to shift its alignment over the years. But regardless, this is what we call skew and it is really often overlooked during the planning process and tends to lead to maintenance issues in the future. We want to install a structure that is parallel with the stream, but it is much easier for a contractor to install the structure perpendicular to the road. So there's a balance between the golden rule of letting the stream be a stream and then constructability. But if we account for the skew during the design process, we save ourselves a lot of headaches during construction and for future storm events. By making the bridge longer, we can maintain stream alignment while keeping the bridge deck in line with the road and reduce, and reduce pressure on the abutments while also being able to pass ice or woody debris. Again, taking these two S's, slope and skew into account will set you up for success. Next slide, please. So the last S is to make sure that there's substrate in the crossing. What we mean by that is making sure that the material through the crossing mimics the natural channel bed material. This is important for the habitats of aquatic species as our goal is to improve in-stream connectivity. As we talked about with the slope of the stream, knowing what types of in-stream features should be present at the crossing is important. It really is amazing how quickly a channel can start to readjust itself once an undersized culvert is taken out but sometimes the channel might need a little bit more help to push it in the right direction. And that's when we would start adding things back in like boulder clusters or step pools. In the photo shown above, we knew that the channel had been manipulated when the boiler pipe was installed and that rocks had been removed. And this was a very steep site. So, it, you know, maintaining um, that channel connectivity was really important. So we redesigned the stream bottom through the crossing by creating roughness features like rock ribs and boulder clusters to mimic the channel that we saw upstream and downstream and provide resting areas and different flow paths for fish and other species. Biologists had tested the brook trout upstream and downstream from the site and found that they had been physically separated for so long that they were genetically different. Literally within 15 minutes after we shut the pumps off at the site and opened the stream back up, I watched a 16 inch long brook trout make its way upstream. And I was really torn at being really happy that I was watching this brook trout, you know, go through the path that I, you know, that I had designed versus wanting to catch it. Um, but, it, you know, my job, it really doesn't get any better than that. Next slide, please. So one of the first projects that I worked on in Piscataquis County was with the Appalachian Mountain Club over 10 years ago now, I think at this point, but this partnership was formed from Stream Smart and has resulted in over 40 AOP related projects on their property, opening up many miles of habitat for native brook trout and other aquatic species. AMC has seen the benefits to the streams and to their road system and have promoted the Stream Smart process to other land managers, which has brought in new restoration opportunities for the NRCS and other partners. Getting Stream Smart structures on the ground really is a team effort, which includes private landowners opening up their land to conservation work. And with that, I would like to introduce, introduce our next speaker, Steve Tatko, who is the Director of Maine Conservation and Land Management for the Appalachian Mountain Club. Thanks, Heidi. Yeah, I think I uh, 
I think it is 10 years. I think it's 2011. So it's pretty, pretty amazing really to have this juncture to talk about old times and look forward to new ones. So I appreciate it and appreciate the whole team over at, at TNC and the water district, the soil and water district as well, because it is such an important, important team. Um, there we go, perfect. Yeah, so just a brief overview of uh, what AMC is. We're, we're the nation's oldest conservation organization founded in 1876 um, and we own a little bit of land here in Maine uh, as part of our broad sort of regional approach to conservation that stretches up and down um, the Appalachian Mountain chain down into the Delaware Water Gap and all the way up here in Maine. Uh, next slide. Now our land is entirely uh, contained within Piscataquis County in what we like to call the 100 mile wilderness region for the last 100 miles of the Appalachian Trail. You can see our land there in, in orange and we own uh, 75,000 acres. Uh, there's a, a, a lighter yellow color that uh, you can see labeled the PRHF and that's a 27,000 acre property that we're in the process of acquiring. So soon to be 100,000 acres in, that we own in Piscataquis County. Um, and most of it's contained within the Penobscot and some of the upper portions of the Kennebec watersheds. So next slide. And when I think about sort of our forest roads, I mean, my primary job function for the AMC is, is as their forester, their forest land manager. Um, we've got about 310 miles of roads on the uh, 75,000 ish acres that we own and operate. And so we're constantly thinking about roads as one of our ma most major sources of investment. Um, they facilitate public access and public recreation. They um, make or break our harvest operations. Uh, you know, the, the locations of the road either can allow for easy operations or uh, more expensive operations, depending on what the wood markets are doing. And so we've been on this, this uh, really made this really concerted effort to consolidate our road network from permanent use. So in other words, traditionally, uh, many folks might remember that forest operations typically happen in the wintertime over unimproved what we call winter roads where the substrate literally had to freeze to uh, enable the use of that road uh, for forest management and then in the summertime they were completely impassable a lot of those winter roads were constructed with really poor stream crossings uh, that just that weren't sized that were extremely temporary in nature so as a long-term landowner it's in our best interest to move those roads out of out of typically the sensitive environments that they were that they were driven through for winter operations and put them to higher and drier and better ground. And in so doing that gives us the opportunity to uh, create better, longer lasting stream crossings to match these new road locations. Um, and you know, as, as Heidi and Emily both have mentioned, you know, the added benefit here is to increase the hydro capacity of structures and uh, eliminate soil erosion so that we've got permanent solutions that, that uh, work for the long term. Next slide. This is just one little example. Um, this is a, a stream crossing that is probably familiar to lots of you if you've been driving around, or not, not this exact site, but you've probably encountered a site like this on, on other forest roads in your travels throughout the county, where you know in the spring of the year or a big high rain event, you'll see some water flooding over the road. And you know, for most of the time, the water goes back down and life returns to normal. Um, but if you go to the next slide, this is, I took this picture standing on top of that same culvert in that last shot. And I mean, this was, this storm event happened back in 2017 and it was the, the second 25 year storm event or 25 year sized storm event that had happened that season. And when I was taking this picture, you could actually feel the ground shaking um, as the water was trying to pass through this pipe. The pipe actually survived um, but if you see in the next picture, we, uh, we opened it up and actually replaced it. And this is actually that same shot that, that Heidi showed in, in her section just a moment ago where she mentioned the 16 inch brook trout. This is that exact same crossing passing another 25 year storm event that happened the next year. And you can see the, the difference in going from that seven foot diameter pipe to a, to a, a 60 foot wide bridge and, you know, from a, from a landowner's perspective and a land manager's perspective, just not having to worry at every spring runoff event or every rain event and knowing that structures will be there and uh, can handle these weather events uh, is a, a lot of insurance. Next slide. So I, what I hope to do was to sort of provide you some, just some sort of 
basic ground rules for what to think about if you've got stream crossings on your property or in your neighborhood and, and what might be sort of um, key elements that are out there in the woods that might might help you pick these spots and what you know what might be good good stream crossing projects you know a lot of people we've been dealing with beavers for a long time obviously here in the northeast and some people just sort of have a laissez-faire approach where you kind of deal with them you just sort of put up with the messes that they make and clean them out and then you know the next year they're back again and you know one way to sort of think proactively about these particular sites is to is to take the stream smart approach and create bigger openings that are actually easier to maintain and, and present less of a hassle when you're trying to keep these crossings open opening for um, their hydraulic capacity next slide another thing sort of taking a step back there's a bunch of these crossings all over maine where um, you can see on that image is that the roads traveling north south and on the left hand side of the road there's a large uh, wetland area that's flooded and you can see how it's it's backed right up against the road and then on the the right hand side of the road uh, you've got a forested wetland there's a pretty good chance that when they built that road in the 1940s 1950s that it was a consistent forested wetland on both sides of the crossing and then when they put that road in, in through there that road substrate actually acts like a dam and won't allow for natural passage of water through the forest floor or through the road substrate and you create this backwater, which increases the temperature and has a number of negative effects. But just solely from a management perspective, these are often your most unstable sections of road because there's water that's trying to move through them. And so in the spring of the year, these are likely places that if you've got people trying to use your roads early, you know, they're going to make a hellacious mess if they try to drive over this uh, as the frost is coming out of the ground. So these are real opportunities to go in and, and think about using those stream smart tools to actually put in a crossing here if you can find a historic channel and not only restore fish passage, but alleviate a lot of springtime frost damage. Next slide. And I know Eileen will cover this uh, way more in depth, but it's also important to put your ownership in a regional context and just how does it fit in the landscape and, um, and sort of, I'll let Eileen talk about the whole range of tools, but um, you saw this slide or a similar slide to this that Emily presented on showing the, the range of Atlantic salmon critical habitat in the state. And, you know, as AMC started acquiring land, you know, we're a conservation organization, so we prioritize acquiring land in critical habitats. But knowing that just as a forest land manager helps you to make better decisions about potential funding sources that might help you with these projects and actually help you implement these, these stream smart solutions to solidify your road infrastructure. Next slide. So to, as, as Heidi graciously pointed out, we've, we've had the, the good fortune to work with uh, NRCS and the district and TNC you now for about uh, 10, going on you know, almost 11 years. I think this will be the 10th season this summer. And we've done over 40 projects with, uh, with NRCS. We've done a bunch on our own um, as well. And so we're, we're, you know, our goal is to remove every barrier to fish passage on our property. Um, you, those little black dots are the few ones we have left. So another three, three or four years, we'll be, we'll be wrapping it up with the fish passage work, which is sort of astounding to think about. But uh, next slide. There we go. So and you've seen some really great examples of this already that Emily Emily sent, but, um, and this was just sort of encapsulating some of the information I just spoke about, but, you know, these transitions are real and these are meaningful on the ground and the, the impact on the fisheries resource is, uh, is just amazing. You know, it's, um, we've been lucky to work with state agencies who, uh, you know, monitor fish populations and actually even through part of the uh, design installation, the electrofishing that's done to keep fish out of the work site that Heidi talked about. Um, it's just amazing how many of these structures, I think in the 40 or so that we've electrofished over the years, all but two have had fish on both sides of the crossing. Um, and that's, you know, just speaks to the tremendous value of the resource. And it's, you know, sometimes we, particularly here in Piscataquis County, because we're surrounded by a vibrant forest ecosystem, it's easy to forget how rare that is. And that, you know, we have this opportunity to do this restoration work in a place where the resource still exists, the fish are still physically here. And in so many other parts of the country, people are doing this work without 
the fish there to actually use the resource. So it's a, it's a real moment in time that we have an opportunity to be a part of. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, you know, getting back to the, the dirt and the economics, um, the, you know, these, these crossings are real investments in the, the future economic vitality of, of the forest resource itself. And so, you know, having permanent crossings uh, enables you to, to take a number of different management options that if you had shoddy road crossings uh, would be in jeopardy. So in other words, having permanent road infrastructure gives you the chance to take advantage of flexible timber markets you know, if wood prices are up or down and you know that you've got a good road network, you can, you can utilize your resource to make better use of those markets. Um, it also increases property value to a certain extent, even for small owners. If you have a good solid road network on your say family woodlot, um, that's a real investment in, this, in the future of that property that, that directly will pay dividends, you know, if the, if the property ever needs to be sold. So it's a, it's a lot of different multiple benefits beyond the habitat as well. Next slide. And you know, timing is so critical with these things. I think you'll probably hear me say that in the next few slides, but if you can, it's somewhat daunting to think about, you know, as a, as a private, if you are a family woodlawn owner, or even if you're a large, you know, a large landowner, um, to think about taking on these, these projects because they can seem pretty expensive. Um, but if you pair them with other types of, of property maintenance, or you pair them with a great, you know, cost share resources that exist at NRCS, um, you can start to consolidate and, and ease that financial burden and actually put together a package that uh, in the end, um, you know, gives you this opportunity to take, you know, take advantage of a window to make these investments. So it's timing is critical and thinking about these things in a consolidated way is, is really helpful. Next slide. And, and think big, you know, I mean, I think you heard this come through loud and clear in, in Heidi's, you know, and, and Emily's both their segments, these things uh, by design are going to be big and don't be afraid of that. You're going to have a lot of help out there with, you know, literally the best professionals in this field in the state who do this work every day and they'll guide you through this process. And I can say having done the cost analysis on 60 some odd bridges over my time here at AMC that it's nine times out of 10, it's actually cheaper to build a longer bridge on shorter abutments as you see in this picture, than it is to build shorter bridges on taller abutments. And there's a variety of, of uh, side benefits just due to ease of construction. You're out of the water quicker um, than you would be if you were building a shorter bridge on taller abutments where you'd have to be in the stream channel for a longer time. So um, don't be afraid to go big. Next slide. And the materials and fabrication, I mean, they seem somewhat, somewhat daunting. I mean, the designs are complex and uh, they're intentional, but what's great about a lot, of the, a lot of the designs that NRCS comes up with is they're flexible to what's available for materials in your region and in your area. And so a lot of this stuff is available pretty locally. I mean, we've, we kind of pride ourselves on being able to purchase all the materials for the most part that we need for our bridges right here in Piscataquis County with a few exceptions. Uh, so, I mean, these are simple things like concrete waste blocks, hemlock decking, hemlock eight by eights, and steel from a variety of steel suppliers. So um, while they're complex, the, the stuff is mostly off the shelf and it's just a matter of having good, good plans and good fabricators to, to put it all together. Next slide. And this, you know, Heidi spoke about buy-in, which is just so critical. I mean, we've been so fortunate as a large landowner to have uh, good contractor buy-in right from the start. Uh, William London and Sons in Milo has installed all of our bridge crossings. I think Billy and I, well, we built off, you know, 60 some odd bridges together and then we've worked on or repaired 20 other ones. So um, it, it is, it's, it's just critical to have a, a contractor capacity and a relationship with a contractor that you can trust to do the work uh, and, and who knows something about the process. Uh, you know, fortunately, NRCS is a resource for them too. I mean, the way that their plans work and the way that, they're, that the engineering team and the, the support team here um, works with contractors helps them get up to speed pretty quickly and they'll walk them through the process. Um, but it's an important step for you as a landowner to make sure that, um, you know, you can develop that relationship with that contractor that has a good history in the region. Don't be afraid to ask around. 
Next slide. And these really are just investments in the future. And I, I you know, we, you know, for the last couple centuries, you know, our, our existence in Piscataquis County and our livelihoods depends on the forest. And I, I don't see that ever going away. I mean, the, certainly the industry will change, but whether it's outdoor recreation or carbon sequestration, or who knows what uses we'll have for the forest in the future, uh, you know, the roads are our physical uh, ribbon that, that ties us to these places. And so making sure that they're sound and that they're not environmentally invasive on the resource that we're trying to conserve and protect is, is a real investment in everyone's future. So we're, we're really glad to be a part of that here in Piscataquis County. And I think I'm handing it off to Eileen. Yes. Thanks, Steve. Hang on, let me just find. That was a super um, helpful perspective. And all of the previous presenters, um, Steve, Emily, and Heidi, have given a really thorough overview of this work. Um, and so I'll try to I'll try to zoom out a bit and give us give a little bit of a more of a statewide perspective. Um, but before I delve in, uh, my name is Eileen Baderhall. I'm a watershed restoration specialist with the Nature Conservancy in Maine. Uh, and so the stream restoration work that we've been talking about this morning is happening all over the state of Maine and beyond. Um, so I'll give a little bit of perspective of that scale and then um, and then hone in on some landowner specific resources for actually implementing potential projects. Uh, and then real quick, for those not familiar with the Nature Conservancy, uh, we are a nonprofit conservation organization, and we have programs in all 50 states and, and 72 countries as well. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. So just to zoom out for a moment, um, Maine has almost 83,000 miles of streams and rivers. 89% of the state is forested, which many of you I'm sure know the highest percentage of any state in the country. 20% um, is protected land. And so on the map on the left, that's what you're seeing in the green blocks. And then, and this is really key, 50% of Maine is owned by, by private forest landowners. Um, and so just highlighting the fact that there's this huge opportunity to work together um, on stream on the thousands of, of stream road crossings that occur on on private lands and as previous speakers have mentioned um, these resilient connected forests are really key to serving to protect stream streams and habitat locally so locally in Piscataquis County for brook trout and other species but then also providing good habitat all the way to Maine's estuaries and the Gulf of Maine, which of course hosts native ground fish and our 12 species of native migratory sea run fish that we're so fortunate to still have. Um, so how to get, you know, I think the question being, there's there's all these road stream crossings throughout the state. How do we get started? How do we, how do we start to prioritize this work? Um, and so, this slide uh, is just providing an, an overview of the statewide barrier survey. And so this is a survey uh, that TNC in conjunction with NRCS and the US Fish and Wildlife Service and dozens of additional partners uh, have, have been completing this survey over the past 12 or 13 years. And so literally crews in the summer have gone out and surveyed um, a huge amount of the road stream crossings in the state. The last final full field season was in 2019. And so now we have this database with more than 27,000 data points, which is astounding to me every time I talk about this. And those data points are further supported by 70,000 photographs. So we can actually look at a site, look at the inlet and the outlet of the structure, look upstream and downstream. And it's a pretty amazing tool to be able to do this initial desktop analysis. Um, on any particular given site. And so those 27,000 data points are on public and private land, covering about 90% of Maine. And we find that about 30 to 50% of road stream crossings are actual barriers um, to, to fish passage. And so what you're looking at, uh, the map on the left is the statewide barrier prioritization tool. And, and all of those little crosses in, in the watershed are um, road stream crossings, but just public road stream crossings. So um, we, don't, we don't display any of the private landowner data that we have 
in a public way, um, but we can use it to help, you know, specific landowners prioritize their road stream crossings. Um, and, and on that map, those crossings are, um, are prioritized, I believe, for habitat that's, that's important for brook trout in particular. So we have all this data. Um, it's most likely the, the most comprehensive database in the world. Uh, and this, this project collecting all of this data is being emulated in other parts of the US. And also um, I have a colleague that is working on, on helping other programs in, in Europe start to, to collect this data just because it's such a valuable asset for, for planning and management. Um, and so, as Steve alluded to earlier, creating this database was really crucial then for translating all this information into a series of decision support tools that help not only us, but all of our partners prioritize, you know, the most optimal places to invest limited public and private dollars uh, to gain the best returns, both from a habitat perspective, but then also from, you know, uh, a private landowner infrastructure perspective as well. And so, you know, I can't, I could send out afterwards links to some of those resources, but if you Googled mainstream habitat viewer, if you're not familiar, um, you can find the, the public road stream crossings in Maine. And so you could just check out the data and just get a sense of, you know, some local crossings in your area. Um, but as I mentioned, we also have the statewide barrier prioritization tool, which is really helpful, I think, for, um, restoration practitioners and, and biologists and municipalities uh, in, in understanding, you know, thinking about prioritizing potential projects from different perspectives. So whether you're focused in a specific watershed or you're thinking about um, restoring habitat for, you know, with a very specific species in mind. And then we also have a one last tool I'll mention is the Coastal Flood Risk Explorer, which right now is just for really focusing on, on sea level rise and the potential impacts um, to communities, both from an economic perspective, but also from a safety perspective. So, you know, if um, potential road stream water comes up over the road and then emergency services aren't able to, to access because of those flooded roads, that's a major issue. But also, as was mentioned, like in Piscataquis County, you know, we're, we're seeing it here in Piscataquis County and then uh, throughout the state and beyond, we're seeing increasingly um, frequent intense storm events. And so we're working on adapting uh, that tool to also include uh, inland sites. So it would be the inland flood risk explorer. So that will be coming soon. Uh, and I think that will be a really valuable tool. Okay, next slide. So that was just a little bit of overview of the of the work happening statewide. Um, and now I just wanted to take a moment to talk about uh, specific resources for landowners. Uh, and so of course, everyone has met Emily, who's the stream restoration project manager in Piscataquis County. Um, and then there are also additional project manager, managers through the Regional Conservation Partnership Program that are working throughout the state um, to work with landowners on identifying potential uh, road stream crossing issues and, and potentially um, finding resources to implement those projects. So, um, you know, NRCS can provide, also provide engineering and design and assist with the application process to receive both technical assistance and financial assistance. And there's, you know, the programs available, I think, or change, you know, change over time, um, but there's there's available uh, resources through the Environmental Quality Incentives Program or EQIP, and then through the Regional Conservation Partnership Program or RCPP, and that's a program that we've had great success with so far. And the current RCPP is starting to come to an end, um, but we have already uh, TNC has already put together a proposal to uh, for a new RCPP project to to build upon the, the great momentum that we already have. So stay tuned, we haven't heard yet about that, but there may be um, a slug of additional funds specifically uh, for this work. And then as I was just talking about, we have stream barrier data on lots of road stream crossings. Obviously we don't have them on every individual landowner's crossings, but um, you know, for, for larger landowners where we might have this data, 
that's something that we can offer as well as help with prioritizing those sites from both uh, an ecological perspective and then finding uh, where those intersect with the landowner's uh, needs from an infrastructure road maintenance perspective. Okay, next slide. And so while that's coming up, you know, if you think that you have a potential road stream uh, issue or project on your land um, that you would like somebody to look at, I think the most basic way to get started is just to call call the, the county soil and water conservation district office, call Emily uh, or call that uh, the district conservationist at your local NRCS office. Uh, and the first step would just be, you know, initiating that conversation and then uh, a project manager or NRCS staff person could come out and take a look and see what's going on at the site. Um, identify what the potential resource concerns might be and then from there kind of determine, you know, if there might be programs that fit fit that you know your individual need. And so I won't get I won't get too into the weeds in terms of the, the process because you know, Emily or NRCS staff can help a landowner walk through all of these, these various steps, but that's the initial pieces to just get someone out on, on site to check out what's going on and then help you match, you know, that potential issue with, with some funds, whether that's technical and or financial assistance. Um, and so I think I'll leave it there. And next slide is just thank you to everyone this morning for joining us. Looking at the clock, I think we have plenty of time for questions. And so I think I'll turn it over to Sarah if she's been checking out the chat. Maybe we have questions that are coming in. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. That was um, really great. Uh, nice overview of all the great work we're doing here in Maine. Unfortunately, I was kicked off Zoom here a couple of times and I saw that Barbara had a question in the chat box um, and now it's disappeared on me. So if um, Emily, do you happen to see that you could address that for us? Yes. Okay. So I'll read it aloud. Um, when dealing with a stream that comes directly from a lake outlet, how do you balance keeping the lake at a level that keeps homeowners happy with the lake level and keeping the stream deep and flowing for critters? Um, I believe this is currently um, something that Heidi's address, addressing uh, for a private landowner, I think, in central Maine or southern Maine. Um, and I don't know if you want to touch on that, and I can follow up with some comments, Heidi. Good question, Barbara. Um, it really is a interesting balance that trying to keep everybody happy um, because even landowners on the same lake don't always agree on what they want for a lake level because somebody wants to have deep water at their dock and someone else wants to have more of their sand beach exposed um, so we really take time to monitor water levels um, and see what really the natural fluctuations in the lake are doing so we have data to back up um, what we're looking at um, and depending on what the what type of species we're trying to get um, over that you know if it's a dam or a culvert um, what species we're trying to pass would kind of dictate what type of structure but usually we're looking at some sort of fish passage um, or kind of like a rock ramp where we have a, a water level that is maintained at a level that everyone sort of agrees to, um, but then will allow the stream to flow, um, or there's more complex like fishways that are concrete or metal that have, they're very well designed to pass a certain um, type of fish, but they're definitely a lot more expensive. So I don't know if that fully answered your question. Um, if you have, you know, if you have a follow-up question, I'd be happy to try to detail it a little bit more. Thank you, Heidi. I would just add to to follow on what Heidi was saying that it's sort of this, it's the, a compromise between what are the goals 
of a project, right? So restoring fish passage and maintaining lake levels, and sometimes there's other considerations involved. So that definitely all those pieces get factored in. You know, it's not just only the fish, even, you know, the fish don't always take the, <laughs> you know, the highest priority. It's, it's, it's a combination of, of all of those factors. I'd like to input something that I recently learned when it comes to. Does anybody um, else have any other? Oh, uh, when it comes to lakes and streams, and if they have historically been a barrier, I'm talking about what species are in the lake versus what species can get into those bodies of lakes. So these are questions that um, the Department of Maine Inlands, Fisheries, and Wildlife usually cover, looking to see if we open up this barrier, are we going to be letting in evasive fish to? Uh, native water. So that's another another big thing when it comes to opening up um, outlets or inlets to lakes and ponds. I'm going to ask a question or add something. This is Casey. Um, Emily, and forgive me if I've missed this portion of your talk, but do you want to talk a little bit about your role and, and if landowners, just like what you do specifically for the district, like if someone was to call, would you, how would you, how would you manage somebody with just interest in some of these pro projects and um, add that to the conversation um, to see, you know, maybe some potential next steps for people? Yeah, great question. Okay, so my role here at the district is, let's say we have a new landowner interested in seeing if their road stream crossing is adequate for passage. So my initial step was would be to get out there and um, actually see if their crossing is a barrier. Um, we go through a standardized, um, we take standardized measurements and um, basically see if there are issues at that barrier. See if it's perched. Um, if it's perched, it's automatically a barrier, let's say um, a culvert that's perched. And if it's undersized compared to the span of the stream along with the bankful width of um, the stream itself. So the first step for a landowner would basically come in contact with the NRCS or um, with me at the Solar Water Conservation District. We work we work together, I'm kind of boots on the ground for the initial start of this process. And from there we can assess, um, is this crossing an issue and what we can do um, moving forward. And this is where we'll, um, a landowner could get involved with um, the NRCS and talk about what funding may be available for those process, for that process. So those are the first steps. And um, along with just, trying to get a landowner to understand why, maybe why their structure um, has been an issue in the past maintenance wise or why it may be affecting um, the stream itself. Hi, Emily uh, and everybody, this is Sam Brown. Um, thanks, this has been very interesting uh, explanations. I was wondering what, levels of assistance do you give to the approaches to any of these uh, crossings? If, you, if there's, um, can you help with, uh, you know, road, road maintenance or, or design itself as, the, as it pertains to the uh, crossing itself? Yes, so assistance through the whole um, process, if a landowner decides that they do want to move through with seeking funding with the NRCS. Um, I can't specifically speak on, um, let's say, cost share for these projects, but when I can, what I can speak of is um, this, not only is it the um, assistance financially, it's having an experienced engineer 
whose goal for um, these stream crossings are to benefit the landowner themselves for access and for, um, for the organisms. So that includes um, stream surveys that will help with, um, to go, that will go along with hydrology to create uh, these structures. And uh, let's see, what, what else? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to speak on um, the NRCS side of moving forward with funding. I'll just add on to what you said, Emily, with when we're, when we, I am designing the bridge, we're looking at the road approaches as well. Um, because when we're designing the bridge, it needs to be able to pass a certain amount of water. Um, so we're making sure that that road elevation um, is gonna force that water underneath the bridge and not over the road. Um, but there's no point in us spending money on putting in a road that you can't actually get to. So there is, you know, there is an, a certain extent of access road um, that we can do. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of erosion that happens on roads and protecting the water quality is really important too. So that's kind of all incorporated into that. And looking at the type of equipment that's going to be crossing the bridge and the road, because um, you know, sometimes, you know, we might be on a farm and they are only going to be taking across a small tractor, but then we might be out in the woods where they're, you know, have fully loaded wooden trucks that are, you know, 120,000 or 130,000 to 250,000 pounds. Um, so we have a really a wide range of um, vehicles that are trying to cross over these bridges and we take that into account too. Thanks. Yes, Barbara, this recording will be made available. Um, we will be able to send this recording out to um, people who have registered with us because we already have your email. So we can forward this recording on. Looking to the future, I'm wondering if you have uh, any statistics um, on new roads and new uh, stream crossings, let's say in the next five years? Did, can anyone, can, can you hear me? We can hear you. Um, could you say the, could you repeat the question again? Yes, I'm, I'm wondering if in your statistics, have you uh, looked to the future to, to uh, have, a, to try to get a handle on new roads into these uh, wet areas and new uh, stream crossings? That's really interesting. That's a really interesting question. I'm not sure that I have a handle on forecasting potential new road building of new roads um steve as i don't know if you have any thoughts about that like at what rate you might see new roads going going in yeah i mean i can just speak from a general pers from my sense of things i don't have any statistical way to analyze this but you know maine's 10.4 million acres the and otherwise the 10.4 million acres that form the unorganized territories um we have about I think it's 43,000 miles of roads in the unorganized territories. And I think if you look at sort of like a, the rate of road building over time, we had a ginormous spike in road building um, post 1976 with the end of the log drives. Um, and then, you know, that peaked somewhere in the, in the uh, really in the mid 1990s. And then I think we've sort of flattened out um, I'm not familiar with the, the current statistics that come through the Maine Forest Service on permits issued for new forest roads, at least in the, the unorganized territories. It's different for stuff in under statewide standards in the organized areas of the state. But um, I don't think we're seeing the mad rush to build a tremendous amount of new roads, uh, in the, particularly on the private forest lands, just because most of everything has already been roaded. I think I remember hearing one statistic that you know, of the private land base that's focused on, on timber production, um, it's a huge percentage that's already within 1,500 feet of a road somewhere. 
um, which is sort of like the cutoff. You try to have most operable timber within 1500 feet of a road because that eases the operations for the logging contractors. Um, but there's a huge amount of, of uh, what I would say, what I mentioned in my presentation, conversion of winter roads to all season roads, just because our climate's changing and we can't depend on, on winter roads to be fully usable for our, our harvest operations in the way that we traditionally did. So um, there are a large number of large landowners and small landowners that are looking to upgrade winter road networks to permanent all season roads. And that certainly is, is an arena where, you know, smart, smart stream installations can play a huge role. That's very interesting, Steve. Um, the comment about turning the shift in winter roads over to all season roads. Thank you. And I'll just add that our goal is to hopefully not create new barriers. So, you know, we would try to encourage people to use an existing path that already had a crossing over it rather than to create a new one. Um, but hopefully with as much work has been done over the past decade, um, trying to get people to understand the golden rule, you know, let the stream be a stream that if people are putting in structures that they are not gonna be issues um, in the future. Although it is job security for me, but. <laughs> well, and one more thought I had too, just to think about that rate of potential increase, but then there's also roads being de decommissioned. And I think that happens fairly commonly too in landowners we work with that you just don't need access to a particular area anymore. And so rather than put in a bridge, they're just taking out the culvert and, and removing that structure altogether. So there's also the simultaneous decrease happening. Um, and just one more thought about the data, since we're talking about that, that's something that TNC and lots of partners are trying to think about the best way to track, you know, as this, the stream smart concepts and principles gain momentum and more and more landowners are doing projects with NRCS or just totally on their own. Um, the challenge of tracking, you know, we have all this data for the whole state, but then as crossings are improved, how do we gather that information to know and eventually be able to say, you know, 20, 30, 40% of these crossings are no longer barriers or um, anyway, that will be a big piece of the puzzle in, in reporting, being able to track, track that success over time. Uh, I'll just say just having watched this all as a participant from the landowner side, um, you know, it, the people that have been engaged in stream smart work in the state of Maine for the past 10 years are uh, too damn humble um, because you can't find the scale of anything like this going on anywhere else in the United States. Um, so it's, it's something Maine should really be proud of. Thanks, Steve. You know, I only moved back down here so I could work with you again. I just wanted to add that uh, I think Sarah, oh, there she is. Um, there is another question in the chat, Emily, from, I believe, Chris. Okay, the question is, is the lifespan of each crossing factored into the equation to predict potential future maintenance or replacements. So let's see, um, the lifespan, um, each NRCS installed um, aquatic organism passage has an estimated lifespan um, for planning purposes of five years. If I believe that's Correct. So, um, and during this span, landowners are uh, responsible for maintaining these structures um, and the access roads to these structures as well. Heidi, I don't know if you have any other input. Um, I will follow up with that and say, good morning, Chris. I hope you had your coffee and are fully caffeinated on the West Coast. Um, 
but yeah, the lifespan, you know, we expect that, you know, the crossings that we're putting in will last for at least 25 years, depending on the type of materials. Obviously for something that has a wood deck, that's something that's gonna be replaced more often, but the actual steel components um, and the concrete components are gonna last a long time. So um, maybe Steve can add on to, you know, some of these bridges that have been in for 10 years, have you had to replace the decks yet? Um, yeah, it, it depends on on the use, really. I mean, the, um, you know, I, I would say that one critical factor is, you know, just keeping the, you know, that road profile, the approaches to the bridge that Heidi mentioned a little bit ago about, you know, making sure that there's sort of like a, a run up to the bridge so that there's the water shed off of the road before it even gets to the stream. That also helps improve the lifespan of wooden decks. Having a little bit of open sunlight on wooden decks, you know, are you conducting winter harvest operations where you've got somebody plowing over a wooden deck with tire chains on and you know scraping the deck with a plow. So there's lots of different factors that affect the lifespan of a wooden deck. But um, you know, typically really active use like we give our bridges, um, you know, all season use, winter and harvesting, truck and traffic included, you know, we'll get eight years out of a wooden deck. Um, but you know, it, it from in our vantage point, it pays to have uh, someone like Heidi do the engineering to support a concrete deck. So even if we can't install a concrete deck when we do the practice within our CS, we have the option as landowners in eight years or 10 years uh, when we can hopefully afford the concrete deck to actually install the concrete deck. And then, you know, the concrete decks that we do have that we that we truck over and plow and things, you know, they seem to be holding up well after, you know, I think the oldest one we have is seven years old or so with the concrete deck. So um, you know, I fully expect to get 25, 30, maybe 40 years out of a, a all steel and concrete deck bridge, no problem, even with the kind of traffic that we put over it. And the good part is we're not salting on the wood road, so that helps the longevity of the crossings too. I think we might have lost some of our hosts, <laughs> but I'll ask if there are any additional questions. I will say, you know, hopefully when the weather is nicer and we can all actually be in person that we would like to do some, you know, in the field type workshops with you guys um, so you can get out and see, you know, how to identify these crossings, you know, what's an issue because a lot of the work, you know, that we, that comes to us is people saying, hey, this is a problem. I was walking on this trail the other day and I saw this culvert. And, um, so, you know, the education part is really important and plus it's, it'll be nice to be outside and see people in real life. <laughs> Yes, it's a lot more fun and tangible to do it in person than just via Zoom. <laughs> well, I think we keep getting kicked off here in the office, which is very interesting because everyone else seems to be from home. So Sarah and I keep getting kicked off the webinar. So. Um, if there were any questions I missed or any follow-up questions, then please feel free to do that right now. Um, yeah, we, uh, we just got booted off. So ho hopefully I didn't miss too much. Emily, you, you guys didn't miss any questions. We had one from Chris, which Heidi took care of. So I think, I think all the chat has been addressed. Okay, great. Uh, well, we would like to thank everyone for joining us today. And this was a great um, start to my first educational out, outreach with the district. Um, 
like Heidi was talking about, I believe we hope to see everyone outside and in the field and be a little bit more hands-on when teaching um, the importance of, uh, of these aquatic organism passages and stream smart crossings. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody Thank you. for joining. Thank you, guys. Good job. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>